Last month, we covered the second installment of the Legend of Galactic Heroes series, the novels, that is. This time, we're taking book three, the latest installment to be released in English in the U.S. as of this recording. Book four is scheduled to come out in June. Previously, in Legend of the Galactic Heroes, the Free Planets Alliance and the Galactic Empire were torn apart by civil war. The civil war in the Galactic Empire was brought on by through a succession crisis caused by the death of the previous emperor, Friedrich IV, with the heir being still a child. The Civil War in the Free Plants Alliance is a little more complicated. The Free Plants Alliance Civil War was brought on through manipulation by Reinhard von Lohengram, General of the Galactic Empire, Admiral rather, in an order to keep the FPA from taking advantage of the upcoming Civil War in the Empire to try and scoop up some systems again. So, Reinhardt took advantage of the release of a massive number of POWs to introduce a few agent provocateurs to start a civil war, with the plan being to get those forces of the military, or members of the military and some of the civilian government who want to institute a fascist military dictatorship, to start a coup. This coup ended up leading to the death of much of the leadership of the anti-war movement, as a series of protests led by just by a woman named Jessica Edwards, who was introduced briefly in the first book and was somewhat something of a minor character there, are brutally put down by the government, leading to what ultimately becomes a constant roiling state of civil unrest, combined with massive civilian casualties and ultimately the death of Miss Edwards. The coup forces are then are put down, with Yang Wenli's forces taking down the navy forces loyal to the coup, and for moving on to the capital of Hainessen and taking down its satellite defense network forcing the leaders of the coup to surrender. Meanwhile, in the Galactic Empire, Reinhard von Lohengram set himself up as being loyal to the young emperor as a ploy to get the nobles who hated his guts to oppose the government so he could crush them. It worked. Otho von Braunschweig and Wilhelm von Littenheim, along with their voices, forces, joined together to form the Lipstadt League in order to oppose Reinhard. The problem with the nature of their alliance is it's a bit like two wrestlers in a triple threat match teaming up to beat on one of the opponents. The logic is to beat on the one guy until he's out of the match, so you can safely focus on the other. Instead, what actually happens is the moment that the team's target is knocked down, the two participants turn on each other. Occasionally, this kind of alliance lasts an elimination match, but not normally, and that's in wrestling when people are fighting over a title belt that has no actual value in the real world. This is made worse by the fact that the whole raison d'etre of the League can be summarized as we don't like that the Golden Brat was promoted on the basis of merit as opposed to us being the pro promoted on the basis of our aristocratic bloodlines. With the side of we, that is Braunschweig and Littenheim, want the throne, but we want to keep Lohengram away from the throne more than we want the other guy to get the throne. And this leads to a cavalcade of really fucking stupid decisions. Ultimately, this leads to the forces of the Litstadt League getting holed up in Geisberg Fortress, with Littenheim being taken out in combat by Siegfried Kerkeis, and the remaining forces under Braunschweig getting surrounded by the forces of Reinhardt and some forces of Littenheim who defected, and even some of his own forces defected because Braunschweig had the red egg, had the bread idea after one of the planets in his holdings rebelled and killed his cousin, the night when he liked very much, uh, he had that planet glassed. Which is kind of a big deal, because there's a big anti-nuclear taboo in this setting. So this leads to a situation where the plan of the Lipstadt League becomes, well, if we sit and wait in the fortress long enough, Reinhard will get bored and go away, because that's what we would do. Except that's not how Reinhard rolls. And when this becomes obvious, obvious, the brass of the Lipstadt League either surrender or off themselves. However, as Reinhardt finally takes occupation of Gaysburg Fortress, the Lipstadt League manages one little victory. They slip a gun into the surrender ceremony and attempt to kill Reinhardt, but Siegfried, Siegfried Kirkai spots it and ends up taking the shot instead and is killed himself. This in turn leads to a split between Reinhardt and his sister Anne Rose, and a deep-seated bit of melancholy because... Kind of hoye between Reinhardt and Kirkheis. Now, the third book, rather than focusing on a series of military engagements over the course of a year, like with the first two, focuses on one major military engagement and one political one. On the political one, Yang Wenli finds himself called before a board of inquiry by the new head of the government, Job Trunicht, who was the former Secretary of Defense and is the head of basically the pro-war faction of the government. 
Shrunik's pro-war faction is basically more or less without opposition now after the and his war faction was effectively decapitated by the coup forces. As when Li has be been generally passive-aggressively against continuing the war, Trunik either wants Wen Li to come, on, come in hard on his side, or completely removed from the equation. Meanwhile, Reinhard von Lohengram has masterminded the plan to retake Isalon Fortress, by sending Gavesburg Fortress along with the support fleet after it, with the idea being as they can't take Isalon, they can destroy it and park Gaysburg in its place. Worst case scenario, both fortresses are destroyed, and the Empire can still just cruise through the corridor like nobody's business. Meanwhile, on Lysa alone, the defense fleet, currently headed by Yang Wen Li's number two, Dusty Attenborough, and with the assistance of the rest of Yang's staff, prepares the defense with one wrinkle in their plans. Their opponent is operating from the position that Yang is leading the defense, and they'll be a lot less cautious if they real figure out that Yang isn't there. Or rather, they'll be much more aggressive if they figure out that Yang isn't there. So, they have to keep from tipping off the attackers to the idea that Yang is not present. Focusing the narrative of endurance on a single conflict but on two fronts works very well. As with Book 2, the political storyline doesn't fall into the obnoxious trap of military science fiction, where civilian oversight of the military is a bad idea. To the contrary, Yang makes it clear in his internal monologue that he believes and values internal uh, civilian oversight of the military. His objection is with Trunit, as he's basically a fascist warhound who uses civilian and military authority to perpetuate the war effort long after the civilian population and even parts of the military have felt that that's necessary. Again, civilian oversight is important if it is civilian oversight, basically, and it's not and it reflects the pop the civilian populace, and not just a we're putting war hawks in charge of the military, we're letting the uh that sort of thing. The added fo focus of this book, as far as on one engagement and on one uh political conflict, also that it allows more character moments to come to the fore, such as Yang under de facto arrest his war room and facing constant boredom in between court sessions, trying to find a way to write, trying to find something to do to kill time to, while he waits for his next time in court. Same thing with Frederica Greenhill, actively trying to carve her way through the highness and bureaucracy in order to, if not get Yang out, get him legal representation. Further, we have the whole plot element of the defenders trying to figure out Okay, how does Yang fight, would he fight this engagement? Because we don't just have to fight in a way where we're certain we'll win. We have to fight the way that they think Yang will fight this. Or at least fight in a way that Yang would fight this so that they, our opponents, assume that Yang is still in charge. Because the moment they realize that he's not, everything's different. And they will show a lot less caution. It also allows Julian Mintz a chance to show some agency as a character, both in terms of he, for a bit, we see him engaging in active combat roles as a fighter pilot, but also because he has been the Watson to Yang's homes for so long in the first two books, the fact that he has become Yang's sounding board makes him a vital part of the uh, planning for the defense of Iserlon. He knows more than anyone else, except maybe Frederica Greenhill, who was not present, what Yang would do, and how Yang would fight this. And so when the importance of the defense is not just defend the fortress and use our resources to the best of our ability to defend the fortress, but also defend the fortress in a way where our opponents think that it's Yang, that is tremendously valuable. And it makes everything that... Julian has done as an audience perspective character makes that important. So I definitely enjoyed this book. It is absolutely, of the three Legend of the Galactic Heroes books we've gotten thus far, the best thus far. It has been, the series has been showing a steady improvement from book to book to book in the series. It feels that now I've gotten the world building out of the way in various forms from just the general setup of the history of the galaxy in the first book to the political shakeup in the second book, which in turn, by having a political shakeup, it also in turn teaches us and builds, engages in world building for how 
the political systems of the Empire and the Free Planets Alliance work. Now, okay, we've gotten the story out of the way. Well, they've gotten the world building out of the way. You know how the world works. Now we can just go. To make a road trip comparison, the first book, putting gas, was getting stuff in the car, figuring out where you're going on the road trip, planning your route. The second book is picking up any last minute supplies, is stopping to put gas in the car on the way out of town, hitting up the grocery store for snacks and that sort of thing. And now we're on the road, and now we're going. And it is making for a in very interesting story, and I'm looking forward to book four. Now, again, book four will not be out in, until June. When it does, I will give my thoughts on that. I will... And, well, I'd like to know what you think about the Legend of the Galactic Heroes series. Are you are you reading them at present? If so, give your thoughts. If... Are you looking forward to the Sentai Filmworks release of the show, which as yet has not gotten a release date? Again, let, let us know. Um, I ask for those who are reading along to restrain from spoilers in the comments, at least spoilers beyond book three. Similarly, if you've watched the show fan subbed, um, keep that under your hat. Maybe if you want to post in the comments about the anime. Focus more on comparison between the material that we've seen now and the material as presented in the anime without giving into spoilers on anything that's not covered in the three books that we've gotten thus far. Just for the people who are sticking to the books at present. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.